Hello again and welcome to another edition of Newsmaker of the Week. I'm Leon Warden and I'm pleased to welcome this week's newsmaker, the Deputy Manager of the Mars Science Laboratory Project, aka the Curiosity Rover, Richard Cook. Welcome back. Hello. Nice to be here. You know, it's been a heck of a week for Santa Clarita. Over in London, we had uh, Allison Felix winning the 200-meter uh, dash. And then about uh, 350 million miles away, <laughs> we had you stick your own landing. That's right. How perfect was that? Oh, it was great. It's really hard to believe how perfectly it went. It was, uh, you know, we've done so many tests where we've had little things go wrong, and this one was the best. You know, the, the first, uh, our first uh, real performance was better than any rehearsal we did. We are decelerating. Each has separated, separated. we're on the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky cream. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. I gotta explain, you know, you're the you're the deputy manager, which means that you're one of two people who are responsible for getting that Curiosity rover to Mars. And there are a lot of Santa Clarita people on this team too, and it's just uh, it's just a real fun thing for us. You know, and I was thinking. You were the project manager of the 97 Pathfinder mission. You were deputy project manager on the uh, Spirit and Opportunity rovers in 2004. Here we are, 2012, your deputy project manager on... Uh, is there anybody who has landed more rovers on Mars, or for that matter, sent more successful spacecraft to Mars or any other planet than you? Not really, no. No, I think I pretty much got it. There's a couple of other people that worked on uh, this project and other ones as well. But yeah, it's, it's been a good streak here, so. You're making this look easy. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately we, did, we, make it, make, we do make it look easy. Do it's not nearly that, as easy as it looks. Do you so. worry that people are gonna start taking this stuff for granted? Oh yeah, Richard Cook again, so yeah, that one's gonna work. Uh, a little bit. I mean, I think that we, you know, that, that even though uh, it looks easy as it comes off, we do spend a lot of time talking about it beforehand, particularly about the landing part of it and the fact that you know there's stuff you can't predict as far as what Mars is like. They also look at the engineering of particularly the sky crane and, and when people see the video they're like that that looks crazy, right? I mean that doesn't and they were the same thing about airbags the last time, right? I mean there's an element of of landing on Mars that just looks hard. And so I think that, that even though in the end it works and everybody's happy about it, I think they still believe that it's hard every time. Before, I and mean, I do want to get into each of those things, but before we get into that, just tell me real, you know, the thumbnail sketch. What can this rover do that previous rovers weren't able to do? Well, we've, with each one of these missions, we've tried to take a step forward. The first uh, with Pathfinder and the Sojourner rover, it was really just to demonstrate could we drive around on Mars. The second one, we were, we were uh, Spirit and Opportunity, was sort of a robot geologist. It was trying to understand the geology of Mars and in particular whether or not water, liquid water, was present on Mars in the past. And the answer to that was yes. And so this time, uh, because here on the Earth, wherever we see liquid water, we see life. We wanted to send, a, a, although right now we think Mars is too dry and cold to have water, a long time ago it did. And so we think that it could have been possible that, that life developed on Mars in the past. We want to go and look to see whether or not there were the right kinds of environments, habitable environments, things that would have supported life. Mm -hmm. To do that, you have to take essentially, instead of being a geologist, you have to take the geologist and a chemist to Mars. And so in this case, the rover is both of those things. It has the geology equipment, you know, to look at rocks up close and to drill into them. But it also has a chemical laboratory on board that we use to process those samples and to look for things like organic uh, mineral, organic molecules, um, as well as other types of minerals that could have been, you know, could have indicated that life had developed on Mars in the past. You know, uh, this, this rover is demonstrably bigger than anything we've 
set in the past. Uh, how would you describe its size? I mean, the, if the if the uh, if Spirit and Opportunity were I don't know maybe a little bit bigger than this table, I suppose. Right. How would you describe the size? This one's a car. It's really you know almost a SUV size. It's you know between a sort of a Mini Cooper and a small SUV is probably the best way to describe it. It's. Uh, the first one we sent, Sojourner, was about the size of a microwave oven. Mm -hmm. Spirit and Opportunity about the size of a driving lawnmower, and then now we're car size okay. uh, with the rover. And it's really because of the science. In order to to take this chemical laboratory, we had to there was very complicated set of, of instrumentation. We had to have a much bigger rover. We also wanted it to last a lot longer, so we made it bigger so that it could drive further, that it could last longer, that mm -hmm. it could. Um, basically do the, the, the mission we wanted to do for, for quite a long period of time. By making the rover that much bigger, it also meant we needed a whole new landing system, that the airbags, although they worked great in the past, they really can't be scaled up for something this big. They, they really sort of struggled to, to land Spirit and Opportunity. And so something much bigger like this, we had to come up with a new landing system. And so we used sort of what we had done in the past, and then we, we took this big step forward with the Sky Crane system, which which was kind of the new piece of it, mm -hmm. um, and it was the thing that allows us to land this much bigger vehicle. People could probably picture, you know, sending the, wrapping this table here in, in airbags, but, but something the size of an SUV. So, yeah, you came up, and you know, it, planning on this started about eight years ago or so, right? It Around did, in there? yeah, it did. That's actually it, when the project really, it started more like 10 years ago, but it kind of got serious about eight years mm -hmm. ago when we really started to go into the you know, full-scale effort. And how does that work? I guess. Scientists come up with what they want to know, and then it's your job as the engineers to figure out how to make it make it so. That's right. Yeah, and we kind of go back and forth because I mean they they have questions that they wanted to ask about Mars, and in particular after Spirit and Opportunity landed, they wanted to ad and address this habitability question, and so they came to us and they said, well, how you know what kind of a vehicle could you build? What kind of instruments could you accommodate? And then we sort of go back and forth and and try to figure out something that can be done you know, in the time we have to get it done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then once we kind of settle on a concept, then we go back to NASA and we say, you know, this is what we want to try to do in, with the, in concert with the scientists. And then they, you know, go through a bunch of reviews and decide it's the right thing to do. And that, really that approval to go forward uh, started in, in about 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been about six years since we started uh, the full-scale development. And so it's decided that you need to have a chemistry lab and you need to have all these different things. And in order, in order to have those things, it has to be X size. That's right. Okay, so now you realize that the airbags aren't going to work. So take it from there. How did we end up with this crazy looking <laughs> landing system? Well, it actually is is uh, partly a byproduct of what we've learned in the past. That the, that the airbag system, although it's really um, useful and really capable of landing uh, you know, um, on rough terrain, the problem that it has is that it's very sensitive to the winds as you're going through the Mars atmosphere. That as, the, as you're going down through the parachute, you can blow it around and that can cause the thing to move uh, you know, back and forth and to hit the ground you know, with a fairly high speed, particularly sideways. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you need the airbags to protect you. And so, we were, so as part of the uh, process though of building those airbags, we said, well, what we would like to do is to, if we could just get the speed lower, uh, then we wouldn't need to have such capable airbags. And so the way you do that is you build a system that has a much better uh, radar. The, one of the key pieces of the landing system is the radar. You have to have a, a better radar would allow you to measure your speed. It's a Doppler radar, just like a highway patrolman has a speed radar, right? It measures your speed. And by measuring that speed very uh, carefully, you can actually slow the rover down as it's coming down. And you can also make it be able to sense the wind and stop without, you know, and, and handle the winds. The, the, what we ended up doing is by making a better radar, we realized we can make a radar that was so good that you could control the speed to where you didn't need the airbags at all. And, the, and basically with the radar and the right kind of propulsion, or propulsion system, the right kind of rocket engines, you could actually slow the rover down to where instead of having to encase it in all these airbags, you could actually literally put the rover directly on the surface mm -hmm. by itself. And so that's where the idea came from, is to try to sort of build on what we've done in the past, but make it more uh, robust or more tolerant to the things about Mars that we, didn't know, that we can't know. And so we, we you know, had a bunch of different designs reviews, you know, where we get all these kind of experts from outside to come in and try to shoot holes in the idea. And over time, everybody kind of came to the conclusion that this was the best way to do it. And so with um, the Phoenix and, I mean, with uh, Spirit and Opportunity, 
rovers in 2004, they, they did some aero braking, I guess, in the, in, the, in, the, in the upper atmosphere. Right. And then it came down with a parachute and the airbags open and it goes boing, boing, boing on the ground. That's right. Uh, didn't have a powered descent, as I recall. That's correct. And then with uh, Phoenix Lander, which the head of that was uh, over there on the wall behind you somewhere is Barry Goldstein. That's He's right. over at Stevenson Ranch, and mm -hmm. he was in charge of that project, the Phoenix Lander in 2008. And that, as I recall, did have a powered descent. Right. So you've done, obviously, you've done the aero braking, you've done uh, parachutes uh, to Mars before, you've done powered descent before, mm -hmm. but where, what, what's different about this then really is this, where you get to the sky crane. That's right. That's and exactly. so why don't you walk me through that process? Yeah, well, the, the, actually, there is an important difference, too, in the, the aero braking part of it as well that, okay. that it, that's different between what we're doing in the previous missions, that's and right. that's what's called guided entry. That, that in the case of, of uh, both Spirit and Opportunity, Pathfinder, Phoenix, the vehicle, as it's coming into the Mars atmosphere, has a big heat shield. It's a flying saucer, right? Mm -hmm. So it's got a big heat shield in front of it to protect it. But it's spinning. It's like a top. And as it goes down, it just spins, and that keeps it stable as it's going down so that it doesn't tip over or anything. But then when it gets down to where the parachute comes out, the parachute comes out and, and the rest of it goes from there. The disadvantage to that thing is you cannot uh, control where you're going while you're, the vehicle as it's spinning is just coming straight down. It's, full, it's descending like a, essentially an unguided rock. It's basically passively controlled. Mm -hmm. What we wanted to do, and what you, as a result of that, what you get is you get landing footprints that are very big. You don't know exactly where it's going to land. You can't stick that landing you, exactly. right where you want it. That's yeah. right. In this case, we wanted to build a system that could actually guide itself on the way down and use uh, essentially fly like a, not like an airplane because it doesn't have wings, but to use by tipping that, that flying capsule a little bit as you go down and then steering it back and forth, you can actually, t instead of having a big footprint on the ground, you can actually reduce the size of the landing area to a very small, uh, relatively small place. The reason why that's important is because the scientists, they want to put this they want to put this rover pretty close to some pretty interesting and difficult places to land. Mm -hmm. But by having this guided entry, we could actually land on a parking lot right next to Zion National Park, right? I mean, so, right. and that's essentially what we did is we picked a very flat, benign landing site, and, and it's right next to the science, the most interesting science target that the, the scientists that were on this project could identify. Mm -hmm. And now we'll be able to drive over to it in a fairly short period of time and be able to explore that more interesting area. So that's one big difference. Right. Sky Crane is the other one. And really the idea is that, that once the parachute is out, the parachute can slow you down to around 200 miles an hour. The, the par you know, parachutes are great, they're really big, they slow you down quite well, but even then the Mars atmosphere is so thin that you just can't slow down enough. Mm -hmm. And so in our case, and there are some similarities with Phoenix. Phoenix um, when it came out of the, 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 from underneath the parachute, it used the set of rocket engines mm -hmm. to, to fly itself to the ground. This vehicle does the same thing. The difference, a way to think about it, is that when you is all about when you get right close to the ground. In the case of, of the, the the landers like like Phoenix, as it came close to the ground, you put out these legs, and the rockets were underneath the the lander like Apollo, mm -hmm. and it came down. And right as it got close to the ground, it shut off those sure. engines and kind of fell the rest of the way to the to the ground. Mm -hmm. the, that's a good way to land if you're trying to land something that's just going to sit there. The problem with, with a rover is that then if you had this big rover sitting on top of it, you have two problems, right? One is that the rover being on top makes the whole thing kind of topsy-turvy, right? It's very hard to, I mean, it becomes really tall. And so instead, when you drop it on the ground, if it's on a slope, it's going to tip over, right? That's one problem. The other problem is that when you get the rover, if it does land successfully, now you've got this big car that's sitting on top of a table, right? And you're like, how do I get that off the table onto the ground? And so then you have to build ramps, and you have to have complicated mm -hmm. things to deploy the ramps. And if the ramps you know, happen to hit a rock, then you have to have a ramp going off the other way. And so it becomes really complicated. It'd be great if you could just land the rover uh, directly on the surface of Mars and not have to have it sitting on top of something. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, well, why don't we do it, rather than doing it, and, and a good analogy and where the name came from is the way that the Army lands cars, you know, if they're carrying around trucks or whatever, they don't, 
they use helicopters to land, sky crane helicopters, to mm -hmm. land you know, jeeps and things, mm -hmm. and they basically hover above it and they lower it to the ground, right. and then it can drive off and do its thing. And so that's basically what we did, is we took the propulsion, the rocket engines, and instead of putting them on the bottom mm -hmm. with, the, with the rover on top, we just turned it over. We put the rover on the bottom mm -hmm. and the propulsion system on the top. That only works if you, instead of firing the engine straight down, you stick them out at an angle. Side, and so that's right. what we had to do is to make them sort of poke out mm -hmm. the side. And so that's what the, instead of using a sky crane helicopter, the sky crane descent stage is the thing with the propulsion system in it. And it basically would carry the whole thing close to the ground and hover above the ground and mm -hmm. then slowly lower the rover to the surface cut it loose. So it comes to a point where it's where it's stationary. It's not it's almost it's a, stationary. It's, like it's not quite relatively it's, stationary yeah, point right. and then it lowers. Exactly. Okay. Right. And so it, it just seems like there are a whole lot I mean you once said that you know it, there are ten thousand operations that have to go off flawlessly and it only, it only takes one for the whole thing to fail. That's it right. just seems like there are a lot more operations in this thing, a lot more places for things to go wrong. Uh, it's the same, to tell you the truth. I mean, with the propulsion system uh, underneath, uh, like in the case of Phoenix, I mean, the, pro the rocket engines, they have to work. You know, the whole thing has to have a radar to figure out how fast it's going. Mm -hmm. It has to stay stable. And it has to have the, and then in that case, it would have to have things that came out so you could drive off. And so it's, in a way, the, f the functions you have to do, the different elements of it, are almost the same. It's just a question of how you package it. And all those and all those functions have to be pre-programmed. I mean, they you do. you can't joystick this thing. Yeah, as fourteen. Said. The light, uh, light time is fourteen minutes. As it's as it's coming down and you know making these adjustments, it's using radar and whatever to figure out where it is, and then it's firing this rocket and this rocket to 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 come down, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So all that stuff, it has to know how to do that in advance because. You can't. You said 14 minutes. It takes what seven minutes for it to send back to you to know what it no, is. No, it's just one way. Oh, so one, the way signal, one way time is 14 minutes. That's right. Because it's 350 million miles away. Correct. So, for, it would take 14 minutes for you to send. A, it would take 14 minutes for a command for information from it to get to you, and that's then right. another 14 minutes to go back to to tell it what to do. So that's, that's, that's right. why we, that's where we come up with this seven minutes of terror that everybody's heard about, meaning that. Um, well, the seven it's coming in, and you can't talk to it. You can't. Right. You can't fix anything once right. that. Once. Once that. You can't fix anything. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so we have a computer on board that has software that's running that takes all this information from the radar and from the. It has a gyro uh, accelerometer package. It has a bunch of sensors that it uses to figure out its how fast it's going and what its orientation is. And what it does is it takes all that information into the computer, the software reads it all, and then it figures out how to fire the engines, the rocket engines, to cause the thing to, to move around. Right. It also decides when to deploy the parachute and when to do, I mean, it's, it's, as you said, it's all on its own. And it's sending us information back, uh, but we find out you know, 14 minutes after, after it really landed what happened. And it was interesting during the landing event, when the clock got to the point where we were where here on the ground, we said we were seven minutes from going into the Mars atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Then you had seven more minutes after that. By the time we got to that point, somebody said to me, oh, hey, it's already happened it's, in reality. Yeah. And whatever, whatever, happened, whatever happened. has happened has happened. That's right. Watching your body language during that uh, landing event, you look pretty nervous. Yeah. What was making you the most nervous? Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it is a combination of two things. One is that I just know, as I said, everything has to, there's just a bunch of things in a row that have to go right. And there's nothing you can do and about it. And there's nothing you can do about it. The, the, actually, this time, it was interesting, the waiting was the part that was kind of driving me a little crazy, right? I, I was, you know, in the, because people had asked me beforehand in the days leading up to it, are you nervous, you know, or whatever. And I don't usually get that nervous because I know that, that we've done as much as we can, the testing we've done. I mean, there's an element of it that, you're never gonna. The, the risk is what it is, right? You're trying to land something on Mars, and but whatever will happen. And it hasn't been done more times than it has been done successfully. That's right. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the the failures, counting all the other countries that That's have right. tried to do it. I mean, right. the United States is the only one. You're one of. You're basically you're it. You're the guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> the other so countries will. can. Right. They've struggled. Out, has found yeah. your price yet, yeah. but <laughs> but uh, there are more failures than there have been successes. Right. And um, but in this in this seven minutes, I was thinking back to Spirit and Opportunity. Those seven minutes of terror. You basically didn't know anything as it was coming down. Well, we got radio and signals then too. So, but okay. it's the same problem. We couldn't. Okay, but 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 follow me with. Let me okay. indulge me on this. Sure. With Phoenix, there was some more data coming down as Phoenix was coming down, and then on this one, it seemed like you knew a lot. 
And yeah. I guess that's because of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's actually because of the Odyssey, uh, the Odyssey? spacecraft. Oh, okay. Yeah, we actually have two spacecraft in orbit around Mars uh, that are uh, relayed. That's right. The that, that can do yeah. communications relays. They're like communications. So you satellites. had a lot more information we coming did. at you this time than what was. Uh, okay, so explain to me that difference. Um, well, because we've had these uh, in the past, we've had some problems with missions, and we didn't have information about what happened to them. No, we're not going to go into We that. won't talk about that. We wanted to make sure that every time we land something on, on Mars now that we have communications and data basically telling us what happened. So that if in case it fails, to be honest, we'll be able, we'll be able to know what... maybe why. That's right, exactly. And so, and it's actually one of the more amazing parts of it. We have these two spacecraft that are in orbit around Mars, and they're doing their own thing and just kind of, I mean, they've been there, in the case of Odyssey, has been there for 12 years, 11 years. Mm -hmm. In the case of MRO, it's been about six years. And uh, they're doing science measurements, and they have these radios that we put on them, which they actually use to support opportunity. They actually use it, uh, and we continue to use it now after landing. But th they're basically this can both be communications orbiters as well as do their own science investigations. And they're just in orbit around Mars, and and I mean, I know how it works, which is we have to adjust where they're going and everything so that they fly over at exactly the right time. But it is an amazing thing that we have these two spacecraft are in orbit, and then with this one just appears out of nowhere right. and lands, and exactly and at the take, right time, radios on both sides go start working, and, and they, they start pictures of the. Thing that's right, and they take pictures down. of how each cool other. Is that? Yeah. yeah, and so it's a lot of split second timing and making sure that everything works. And so I imagine that the Odyssey team was involved, had to be involved with with your team as well. That's right. Yeah, and we did tests where we tested out here on the ground. You know, could they? You know by simulating it all, could we get it to work? But obviously we can't test with the real Odyssey spacecraft. It was at Mars, mm -hmm. and ours was on the way. And mm -hmm. so the first time it ever actually talked to each other was in that moment when they locked, when the communication signal was connected between the two of them during landing. So you're, you and your team have to be able to anticipate absolutely just thousands and thousands and thousands of things on the front end before you, before you ever send that thing off to the Cape. Right, we, we do a lot of testing where we try to make sure not only are all the things that we think it's supposed to do going to work? But also, what happens when they don't? How does it? Mm -hmm. How does the system? Does it break gracefully uh, break down? Right? Or does it? You know, we don't want it to. to um, if if one particular part has a problem, that the whole thing stops working. We try to make it robust to, to different bad days. Right. And you know, I'm talking to uh, Scott Evans. You know, he, he's he has the uh, navigation software. Uh, development team, mm -hmm. um, and you know, in one of our another one of our Santa Clarita residents here. Yep. But he was saying that um, there were actually very few course corrections that needed to be made. Right. Yeah. We actually only did four. Uh, we had planned that we could have last minute. You know, we because one of the big things we don't know when we're sending one of these spacecraft to to Mars is where Mars is exactly, right? I mean, and so at the last minute, you could find out that Mars is in a slightly different place than what you thought, and then, you know, it's equivalent to the spacecraft being in the wrong spot, because all you care about is where they are relative to each other. Mm -hmm. And so we had to have the ability at the last minute to do a last minute correction of the of the course. Didn't have to do it. It was basically all the way in from the, la the last maneuver we did was about eight days out, uh, where we had to adjust the, the, mm -hmm. the entry point a little bit. Basically nailed it at that point, and it was all these mathematicians and everybody who do this. I don't know; it's voodoo to me. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, you're basically shooting a, a, a golf ball or a pebble or whatever from Earth to 300 to a little speck of dust 350 million miles away, and you, and you were able to basically get that dead on hole in one. That's right. Yeah, we have a and few. It, it's like a par. People always say it's like a par four. You know, you have four shots, like a golf. Playing golf between here and Houston, and you have basically four shots mm -hmm. to get it in for mm -hmm. the size of the. Hole and the size of the ball. Yeah. So. And one thing that I thought was kind of interesting was, at least in California time on Sunday night when you uh, landed the thing, it was Neil Armstrong's 82nd birthday. Mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself and your team fitting into the, you know, when when your own kids look back on this, 20, 30, 40 years from now, um, where do you see yourself and your team fitting into you know the history of space exploration? Well, I mean, I think we're we're setting the stage. We're putting the footprints, so to speak, although they're not really footprints, in the ground, you know, so that hopefully we'll be able to send humans there. And I think in two ways, right? I think both because we are 
um, answering some fundamental questions about Mars. We're seeing what it's like on the surface. We're carrying an instrument to measure. About life. Yeah, measure radiation. Answering the fundamental questions right. about life. We're doing some, some, some precursor activities for sending humans there someday. I also think in a way, hopefully we're inspiring people to keep doing this, right? And in particular kids and people that can, that can view this as being an interesting thing to do and, and being part of teams like this. They will keep building and hopefully send people there someday and hopefully some, you know, maybe my kids or certainly other kids that are being born today, being born today, that they basically will, you know, view this as a reason to get involved and maybe will be a first astronaut to go to, the, to Mars or something. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why I do it is because I think it's a, you know, it's what got me involved in it was seeing the Apollo landings and, and, and being, seeing the space program and hopefully other people are out, other kids are out there doing that today. And your kids are how old now? My oldest is 16, my youngest is 11. And where did they go to school? Uh, my, they actually go to Canyon. Two of them go to Canyon High School, and one goes to Sierra Vista Junior High. So they're old enough to understand what you're doing. How, 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 how do they see it? How do, you th how do you think they see it? I mean, are they, are they proud of Dad when they go to school and say, hey, guess what my dad did? Or are they you know, like normal teenagers and, oh, yeah, Dad's doing work. I don't know what he does. Both. You know? they're, they're both, <laughs> both of those things. So, the, I mean, the, you know, the, certainly when it comes to giving tours of JPL, I mean, they've been to JPL so many times now that they're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to go back. I've seen everything. Do they even know? Do they, do they know how important yeah. it is? Yeah, well, but the, when the landing occurred, they all went down to Caltech and watched it down on, on, uh, on at, the, at the Caltech to see, with a whole bunch of other friends and family, and they were pretty impressed. I think they thought it was pretty cool because I mean it is. It's pretty you know a neat thing to see and to be part of the whole because it's hundreds, thousands of people have worked on this project. To be part of something that's that big and to kind of see how it all come together in a sort of a dramatic way, I think is is really was entertaining for them and they had a great time. The question that I like to ask in this kind of thing, we got to wrap it up, um, is what does it take to be you? And what I mean is, <laughs> there was a kid who asked a question at that midnight press conference. I don't know why she was up that late. But <laughs> at that midnight press conference, who asked what it was that got you uh, involved and yeah. they brought you to NASA I think is right. what she asked you know was it things like Neil Armstrong and that sort of thing and I liked your answer let's finish on that tell us more or less what you said well I said it was the problem-solving part of it that, that I you know and, and I think that being funny that the rover would be named curiosity you know being curious in school and really kind of interested in learning and wanting to solve hard problems one thing I learned is that no matter how, what kind of problems you solve, there's always harder ones out there if you go find them, right? And, and if you're a person who's interested in solving problems and is curious about the world, that will lead you down a path. It may not lead you to NASA. It may not lead you to, to, to what I do, but it certainly will lead you to doing something important and something interesting because the interesting things are the things we don't know about. And, and I think that, that, or at least in my opinion, and I think that in this case, you know, if you go and you learn how to learn and you learn to go ask hard questions and to try to solve them, it will lead you into to places like NASA where that's what we do, right? I mean, we solve hard problems and we put together big teams of people who work together to solve even harder problems than any person can do by themselves. And so that's, I think NASA is a great place for doing that kind of thing. And I think if you go to school and you, you try to, to move in that direction, you could end up at a place like NASA. Richard Cook, sticking the landing on Mars every eight years. I'll be fascinated to see what you do eight years from now. <laughs> yeah, but we'll see. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us. Missed any portion of this program? You can see it again and again on scvtv.com. Check back here, Time Warner Cable Channel 20, AT&T U-verse 99, Sunday, 8.30 a.m., Thursday, 9 p.m., for another Newsmaker of the Week.